I'll go ahead and hit record. And Michael, Anna, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Good to go. Good to go. Thanks. All right, let's rock and roll. So welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about these two things today. We'll start with what's new in Ambari 2.7. So what I want to kind of talk, go through now is just what are the different release themes we had, and then we'll cover the individual features that contribute to those specific themes. Number one is usability. So in Ambari 2.7, we put a lot of time, effort, and energy to update the existing UI that we have. Like every single screen you can think of within Navari has been updated. Um, we want to make it A, look like the rest of our new UIs, and B, take into consideration all the paper cuts and feedback that we accrued over 2017 and to make the UI easier to use and less, uh, less painful in some areas. Number two is we want to ensure that we could manage some of our customers' largest clusters. So we have a lot of large customers that are you know, moving from the, you know, 2,000 to the 3,000 to 4,000 node range. And we want to make sure that Mbari can keep pace with those customers and ensure that we can manage those larger environments. The third is around just simplifying configuring security within um, okay. HTTP itself. So with DPS, there's a lot of SSO requirements that are you know, being brought to the table. We want to make it easier to enable Nox SSO for DPS services. And we also want to ensure that for customers that have existing enterprise free IPA infrastructure that they can use that for their KDC. The next is automation extensibility. So this is really focused on ensuring that we, um, oh yeah, yeah, free IPA, everyone loves it. Um, uh, one of the big things that kind of came out when we were talking to customers and field folks in 2017 was uh, lack of documentation and ability to kind of experiment with the API that we have within Ambari. And so we put a lot of work into documenting our API and providing some tools, as you'll see, to make it really easy to discover the different aspects of our API and use it. Um, the last thing is integration with third-party file systems. So as we look into things like Isilon, if you've ever tried to get our stack working with Isilon, you'll realize it was a very painful process. I'm sorry I had to go through that. Uh, we worked really closely with EMC to develop a management pack to make Isilon just like super duper easy to insert into our stack and um, get all our components working with it. So we'll take a look at that as well. And lastly, paper cuts. So, you know, one of the things we've been kind of harping on for like the last 18 months has been um, a reduction of kind of daily pain. So making sure we can kind of take a second pass at existing features and make sure that the new features we build um, are usable, understandable, easy to troubleshoot, and can reduce uh, those issues that you kind of wear on you over time. So let's jump right into usability. So we're going to focus on kind of what does the new UI look like? What are some of the key differences? And we'll go from there. So if you've been you know, looking at our new products like DPS, DAS, DSS, et cetera, they all look the same, which is cool. Um, the reason they look the same is because our UX team, Hushang, Subhajit, Priyanka, uh, and others have put a lot of time, effort, and energy into creating a design spec called a fluid. If you want to actually see the details about this design spec and the different widgets and the different kind of uh, style guidelines, you can go to productdesign.hortonworks.com and you can see a lot of the different pieces of information about the reusable components that we're building to ensure that all of our new UIs look and feel the same. And you know, Ambari is one of the biggest UIs we have that's gone through this process of kind of converting from a pre-fluid to a fluid design spec. And so we'll take a look at what do those things look like. So at install time, the first you'll notice is obviously the login page looks different. But um, from an install perspective, we've made some changes that will highlight others, you know, just look a little bit different, but function the same. In the Manage and Bari screen, we've kind of decluttered it and put a really sharp focus on the one thing that you want to do, which is launch the install wizard. So just front and center, the call to action, just click on the big green button. The getting started, selecting versions, install options, confirm hosts are largely the same, just look a little bit different. So nothing kind of new to report here. Where the changes really start happening is in the, um, the choosing of services. So as you'll notice, the file system has been separated from the service list. This is for a couple different reasons. Um, I had talked about Isilon previously. We'll take a look at where that fits in. But in the future, we want to be able to support multiple external file systems, Isilon being one of those. So you will have situations in which a customer is like, hey, I want to install HTTP, but I don't necessarily want to use HTFS. Maybe I want to install it on Isilon or S3 or ADLS, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to build a pluggable mechanism so we can insert third-party file systems into the stack. And as we'll see with Isilon, uh, it's the first to take advantage of that new framework. 
The next thing is behavior changes around choosing services. So one of the things that we did change right off the bat is uh, a default Ranger and Atlas installation. So with all the changes that have happened in Hive and others, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we wanted the ability to basically include Ranger and Atlas from the get-go so that um, we didn't have to add these after the fact and customers can easily take advantage of these great security and governance tools during their first install. So what you'll notice is these limited functionality warnings that kind of pop up if you don't choose Atlas and Ranger. So we have one for each. If Ranger is not selected, you'll see this warning pop up basically saying, hey, Ranger's great, you should totally install it. Uh, Atlas, same deal, we really want you to install Atlas. As you've known, um, these carry with them a lot of different dependencies. And sometimes it wasn't very clear which dependencies were needed under what scenarios. And so we've gone out of our way to ensure that the user understands that, hey, guess what, HBase is required for Atlas. You do have the ability to configure Atlas to use an external HBase, but we're just reminding customers that you probably are going to want to install it, you know, as part of the install that you're going through. Same thing with Solar. So InfraSolar is used both by Ranger uh, as well as Atlas, and so they each have limited functionality warnings reminding the customer that you can install an InfraSolar that will automatically wire everything up to, or if you have your own external solar cloud, you can configure it during the customized services step. And the Kafka is needed for Atlas, so we pick it up and pull it in right away. So if you heed all of these warnings, you'll get to the customized services step with no required configuration. We'll do all the magic for you. Uh, previously, there was a lot of kind of missing configuration that you had to kind of figure out via docs, but we've taken care of that. So now, if you go through and say, yes, I'll install what Mario wants me to install, everything should be green and good to go. The next paper cut that we want to kind of attack was the most commonly modified configurations. So within Ambari 2.6 and previously, the uh, credentials, databases, directories, and accounts were the you know different uh, configuration items that were like you always edited them, right? You always had to specify credentials. You always had to choose databases. Most likely, if you're doing a, a real install, you're going to want to customize the you know log directories and data directories for different services. But you just have to kind of dig around at each individual service to find it. And as an SC going through the process of installing clusters, you had this kind of mental checklist of all the different tabs you had to click on and different fields you had to validate uh, so that everything looked easy. So what we try to do is pull all of those most commonly modified things into one place. So that's one of the big changes that you'll see in the customized services step is we factored out credentials, databases, directories, accounts into their own panels. So anything that requires a password or username will be here in the credentials panel. Anything that requires a database will have its own tab here so you can choose which databases you'd like to use. And we also have a test button that's a little, uh, below the fold here. Um, directories, so this is where we have data directories, log directories, and PID directories for each of our individual services. So you no longer have to you know, dig through each of the individual configs to find those. And then accounts. So we've done you know, one main thing here in accounts with these specific select boxes have been made easier to understand. So the labels are easier to reason about, as well as the descriptions, if you hover over them, will tell you plainly what Ambari will do and how you can kind of toggle this behavior. All configurations, we've made some changes here. This was a big paper cut for a lot of people, mainly because if you remember in previous versions of Ambari, you'd make a change to a specific um, property, and we would say, hey, we're gonna make these changes for you. You're like, oh man, thanks Ambari, you're the best. And then you hit next, and then boom, we'd pop up like 15 things you had no idea to change and really no way to get to um, to make the changes that we're saying are critical or, or we really want you to do. So we've moved all of the configuration warnings and recommendations into this little bell here. So this bell will like ring if there's uh, you know ever any kind of changes that are made that require your attention. And when you pop up this little context menu, what you'll see is um, all the different things that we want you to review and take a look at. So we have three main sections in here. One is critical recommended configurations. So these are things like, hey, guess what? You can't proceed until you fill this in. In this case, I don't have any because everything's filled in. But I have some highly recommended configuration options. These are the things that you would normally see in that pop-up uh, in Ambari 2.6 and, and before. So we put those directly here. If you click on a property, this is a hyperlink. So it'll actually take you to that tab and it'll take you to that property so that you can address it directly, uh, which we would try to make it really easy to, you know, for you to see what we're asking you to do and get there. And then the review recommendations, please read this wording carefully. <clears throat> what I want to kind of stress in the enablement is these are changes we've already made on your behalf. So 
the recommended value, we've done that. If you don't want us to do that, just uncheck these boxes. So this specific menu is something we worked really hard on to make it a lot easier to have a successful default first install experience. Um, the next thing is blueprint export. So this is also a big paper cut. Um, it was hard for people to kind of craft their own blueprint, so to speak. And there's a lot of tools written by a lot of great people to help you know, kind of make a blueprint. Now what you can do with an Ambari is just use Ambari, click through, choose the services, map it to a specific host, do all the configuration. And before you hit deploy, there's this generate blueprint button. This generate blueprint button will give you a zip file that has both the blueprint as well as the cluster creation template in it. So you're good to go. So we, we've kind of handled blueprint export during the install as well as, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, post install. So you don't have to like go through your browser history and remember, uh, you know, format equals blueprint. Okay, uh, let me look at the comments here real quick, see if anything popped up. Awesome, sweet, okay. Post install changes. Once you've installed the cluster, successfully of course, um, we've got our navigation changes. So kind of in line with that fluid design spec, we have left hand nav. Within that navigation, services and cluster admin can be collapsed. And you can also collapse the entire menu to give you some more uh, real estate. The other kind of change is the views themselves also have the navigation pane attached to them. So if I actually click on the SmartSense view, for example, I can see that my left-hand nav is retained. So I can you know, navigate to hosts or navigate to service summary of whatever it might be uh, from uh, within the view, not have to go out to a different tab. The dashboard has been modified slightly. So we've just kind of made some changes here to the layout and some of the widgets. The service summary, as you'll see, has been changed uh, quite a bit. And we try to make it consistent across all the different services. So what you'll see on the right-hand side is quick links is here on the right-hand side. You'll see it for every service. We always have the quick links laid out here. Uh, this actually surprisingly was one of the things that a lot of people complain about. They're like, I can't find the quick links. Where the hell are the quick links? Uh, so instead of burying them behind a dropdown, we just put them in a list right next to the service summary. The other thing you'll notice is the summary information itself is really focused on component health and key statistics about that specific service. The visual representation of the metrics that we used to have on the service summary has been factored out into its own tab. So every service that has you know, metrics that have a, a visualization, there's a metrics tab for it. Heat maps, oh my gosh, heat maps. Heat maps have, are something that we've had for a very long time, but they haven't worked for a very long time. Um, when I talk to customers, SCs, they're like, we'd love to use heat maps if they worked, caveat. Um, so we put a lot of time, effort, and energy in 2.7 to make heat maps work, make them great again. And um, so now as you hover over a specific you know, host and rack, you can see the um, specific metric that we're reporting. You can configure the uh, kind of you know, red, yellow, green uh, metrics, et cetera. So please use heat maps again. I hope you enjoy them. Uh, the next thing I want to highlight is the context menu. So in the fluid spec, context menus are, are used pretty heavily. But one of the you know, kind of big things when I'm demoing in Bari 2.7 or people are using Bari 2.7, people are like, oh my god, where is start all, stop all? How do I download client configs? Uh, it's in the context menu. And so you see a number of different places where you have this context menu not only in services, but we also have it on each of the widgets, as we'll see in a second in the host list. So I think one of the small changes, but one of those things that a lot of people have been frustrated by is uh, the filtering that we have within the host list. So we've revamped filtering. This is a demo of just one of the things that um, I really appreciated is if I have a really big cluster, I'm usually looking for a single host. So I just wanna hit filter, type in the host name, hit enter, and it automatically be recognized as a host name and find me that host. So that works now in bar 2.7. Once you've found a specific host, uh, we've kind of done away with those big, huge buttons and we've just used uh, actions context menu here. So all of your stop, start, restart, decom, recom operations are in this little action context menu in the host detail. Next thing, log search, tech preview, refresh. So many of you on this call have, have worked tirelessly to, <laughs> to help us with this refresh. And I thank you very much. Uh, we spent a lot of time with the field and customers kind of pouring um, over the old UI and making some changes to make it look more like our fluid spec and uh, take other aspects of other UIs and put it in here. So one of the things you'll notice is our time picker. We really like Grafana's time picker, so we took it, it's great. So now you have quick ranges. You can say last 60 days, previous year, last three hours, whatever it might be. The other thing we um, kind of may, may ch change is the uh, specific conditions around includes and exclude. Um, so you have levels, components, hosts, you can search and select and we'll basically you know, filter logs by those specific criteria. We also added uh, multi-cluster support because uh, a lot of our customers, especially in the cloud, want to have one single AMS and one single log search that multiple clusters can push data into. 
So now um, you'll see in a lot of different places uh, the cluster selection. The log index filter is something that's also multi-cluster aware. Um, this is something that allows you to control the log feeders and, and what log levels are actually sent to solar to be indexed. So in order to you know, ensure that we don't uh, just completely destroy um, <laughs> our, uh, our index, we allow you to basically say, hey, everything is worn, fatal and error. Uh, info debugging trace can be enabled if you want to, but they can also be added per host or with uh, expiration. So I also want to stress Ambari 2.7, log search is still in tech preview. Um, the log search will be J and Ambari 3.0. That's something that kind of popped up. So still, we, this is a refresh, um, still in tech preview. We also have expiry dates. So you can basically say, hey, I want to do debug and trace for the next 30 minutes or debug and trace for the next day uh, that we don't end up filling your index up after you're done troubleshooting. Uh, the next kind of paper cut that we're working with both the field, product teams, and customers was um, on adding additional components to uh, the log feeders. So if you want a log feeder to pick up um, a specific component or specific other service, this is something in working with George when he was looking at pulling in the storm worker logs. He's like, hey, how do I add the definition for storm worker logs? I'm like, oh man, here's some documentation, some API calls. So we added a UI just for that purpose. So now you can add or modify services and components. You can um, specify some sample logs. You can see the actual results of you know, the Grok expression and showing that, hey, yeah, I can parse it and this looks correct. These will also be updated and pulled into log feeders um, at, at runtime. So there's no more kind of bouncing and reconfiguring. We've uh, revamped the configuration API. Viewing improvements. So if you're looking for a keyword, in this case, I just typed in process report and hit enter. Uh, you, you have this little button right here, much like uh, the Kibana, which you can click it to toggle include exclude. And then we've also taken a page out of the CloudWatch logs playbook because I really like how they do multi-line handling. So for really long log entries, we'll add the ellipses. But if you click on this little button here, you can see the entire log line. And then the other thing that's really important is context. So you're like, okay, that's great. What, what, what was reported before and after this specific log? You can click on it, click context, and we'll show you, you know, the uh, log entries that happen around your specific match. Um, let's see here. Let me check the chat real fast. Next thing, uh, scalability. So this is something like I had said before. We have you know big customers that um, have large clusters today. You know, kind of Ambari two six is really focused on kind of its maximum cluster size being about twenty five hundred nodes. But we wanted to be able to double that because um, when you want to move above that that level, and we need to be able to scale with them. And actually, interestingly enough, CDH six their kind of max number of nodes that Cloudera Manager can manage is 2,500 nodes. So this is great. We're double that. So that's fantastic. How did we actually get there? That was not easy. Uh, one of the things that we had to completely kind of revamp was the agent to server communication pattern. Traditionally, um, our agents and servers have communicated to each other over heartbeats. We still have a heartbeat, but the primary communication channel is over WebSocket. So it basically pushes much more work down to the agents. Uh, allows them to hold state and only basically kind of consume differences and push events back to the server uh, as needed over that WebSocket channel. So as we'll see in a moment, it's reduced uh, significantly the amount of data that goes even between the UI and the server and made, uh, made the chatter a lot less, a lot less crazy. Um, where these UI events and agent events are used uh, are, are here. So basically we use it a lot for alerts. We use it for state changes calculating stale configurations, configuration history updates, and host state. So kind of one of the big things that everyone had asked is like, oh my gosh, with service auto restart, what happens if the Ambari server is down? Now all that state information is held in the agents so they can work autonomously. Even if the server is down and the box comes back up, the agent can automatically restart those components because it knows what it needs to do. It's got it all in the agent. So what I want to kind of show you next is a, a, like a network panel of Ambari 2.6 versus Ambari 2.7. So as you notice on the left, Ambari 2.6 is very chatty. This is just on the HFS service summary screen. If you look at Ambari 2.7 on that same screen on the right, you'll notice there's significantly less requests. One of the things we noticed with you know, working with a lot of our larger customers is you know, at times for different operations, Ambari 2.6 could have like a couple of gigs of data moving from the, the server to the UI. And a lot of our customers had kind of complained about just the bloated quote unquote feeling of the Ambari UI. So with this kind of WebSocket architecture revamp, we can cut down on the amount of data that's passed back and forth, making the UI much more you know, performant at scale. We still definitely have some areas of the UI, just full disclosure, that we want to be able to really kind of tighten up and make faster. That's specifically the configs page and the host list. 
So we'll be working in a bar 271 to really nail those and make those um, more performant than they are today. But overall, uh, in large clusters, the bar 270 UI will be much more performant uh, at scale. Okay, let's see here. Checking the chat. One moment. Cool. Uh, who, what, when, why? So this is something that frustrated a lot of people, especially we want to focus A on, hey, I want to be able to manage a ton of hosts and B, our operator teams are growing. So instead of like, you know, one or two people using the UI, it could be four, five, six, it could be 10 operators using the UI at one time. And this was a humongous frustration uh, for people just being able to say like, who the hell restart HCFS? I, I, don't, I don't know, did you restart HCFS? Like it just kind of ended up people just yelling for cube walls, like, hey, who, who's, who's adding a host right now? You know, those kind of things. So we took care of that in bar 27. So now in background operations, you can see who did the operation. We also have that with the uh, wizards. So if you add a host, add a service, uh, enable Kerberos in the cluster, it all will say who actually initiated an operation. So you know who to blame and who to yell at. Bulk operations. So bulk operations is something that um, you know, we, we've had within the host detail for quite some time, but we wanted to be able to add additional operations. This is like a specific ask for some of our bigger customers that have uh, a lot of nodes. Um, Add component, delete component, and delete host from this specific screen. So when you actually go to the host list, you can you know, filter or you can do whatever you want to do to find the hosts. Once you've selected specific hosts, you can then go and you can say, hey, I want to be able to add a region server to all these selected hosts or uh, decom a data node or decom a region server or whatever it might be, or even delete hosts. So that's something that um, we have the capability to do now. Obviously, with you know great power comes great responsibility. We want to add a lot of validations and um, you know confirmations to the specific process, so no one um, could hurt themselves. <laughs> um, so one of the things is uh, bulk operations are now validated to check for making sure the components are in the appropriate state. So if you have highlighted you know 15 hosts and you want to add a region server to those 15 hosts, if a couple of those already have a region server on them, instead of failing the operation like we used to do. We'll basically say, hey, I can add you know, a region server to these 13, but these 12, I can't because they already have one. Do you want me to do that? Yes, cool, go ahead. The other thing is making sure the hosts are in the appropriate state. So I wanna make sure like I'm not deleting a host that has a master on it, or I'm not deleting a host that's in maintenance mode for whatever reason, we'll have check, we have checks around that. And then we also have checks around cardinality. What this means is within our stack definitions for specific components, you basically define like, hey, every cluster has to have one or more HDFS clients or every cluster has to have one or more region servers or data nodes or whatever it might be. If the result of the operation will violate any of those um, cardinality constraints, we'll pop up and say, hey, guess what? I can't do that. I'm sorry. But uh, we try to put a lot of guardrails around this process so that we could enable power users but not uh, destroy clusters for our non-power users. Uh, the next paper cut is on ad service. So this is one of those things where you might not notice this as an issue if you're just doing demos, but if you're like working with a real customer on a real cluster that's got you know, 15, 20 different components on it, and you go to add service, and you scroll from left to right to find the clients, so like, oh my gosh, I have to like hold my finger on the screen to remember which specific rogue uh, is, you know, for what specific host, so we fixed that. So now we freeze the host panel, the host uh, column, something really small, but again, a true paper got just really annoying. Um, security simplification. So one of the things that we wanted to really focus on, oh man, you know what, I think, uh, of course, PowerPoint. PowerPoint only crashes when you're doing field enablement. It just knows. It's kind of like the Volkswagen thing. It just kind of knows you need it. It blows up. Fantastic. Okay, where was I? Boom, there we go. It is, for real, Anna. All right, simplified security, boom. DPS. DPS needs Knox SSO for Ambari server, Ranger, and Atlas. And so we've extended our Ambari server setup SSO to also configure those specific services. So if you want to add a cluster to DPS um, and you want to make sure this is an easy process, you can install and configure Knox. You can run the Ambari server setup SSO. We'll prompt you for all the SSO related information. We'll ask you, hey, do you want this for Ambari? Do you want it for all the other services that, I, that Ambari can enable SSO in, like Atlas and Ranger? prompt you for some information, and then you're good to go. Um, try to log into Ambari, and Knox pop-up will be there. If you have issues, the configuration, or you, uh, there's redirect problems or whatever, Ambari can detect 
a lot of those common problems and will pop up this little uh, redirect warning saying, hey, it looks like you're having problems. You can you know, bypass Knox you know, with this, this local login. Um, this is something especially like if you have a cluster, Knox is installed in the cluster, Knox goes down, but you can't log in. We try to kind of help you get some outs for that so you don't have to disable SSO to get back into the cluster. Free IPA, yes, everyone loves free IPA and has been waiting for it forever. So the backstory behind free IPA, this is actually a feature that was a community edition. So it was a really high quality edition. This is something that I think a lot of you have used in experimental mode in Ambari 2.5 you know, or 2.6. But this is something that we've taken in, QA'd, and it is now um, part of the stack. So it's GA, meaning I, if you want to um, enable Kerberos using free IPA, you can totally do that. So for some background with free IPA, it's affected like an open source Active Directory. It has a lot of the same type of components, DNS, LDAP, KDC, but also allows you to you know, control other things like pseudo policies, SE Linux, and a lot of our customers are using it today. We wanted to make sure we had a good story around integrating with it. So we support free IPA uh, 4.x. Uh, this obviously assumes that you've already got IPA set up and configured and ready to rock in your environment. We, we are not installing it, just like we're not installing MIT or Active Directory. Um, we, in our documentation, you'll notice that, you know, much like Active Directory, we tried to come up with, you know, what's the minimum permissions required for the user that you configure Ambari to use. And Kat, who's our, you know, new PM for Ambari, has worked really, 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 really uh, tirelessly to make sure that we've got that right and um, has tested this feature herself, which has been awesome. Automation extensibility. So this is one thing that, I mean, last year, I can remember it was like, a month straight of just because every customer I talked to was like, we need more information about the API, the API, API, API. It was just everywhere. Um, and so we, we put a lot of work into swaggerizing uh, the vast majority of our APIs. There's a few that we did not get to, but this is like the bulk the majority of all the things that uh, the UI uses and human beings use uh, has been documented here. So if you install Ambari 2.7, go to slash API dash docs, you'll get to this specific UI. Uh, here you can see the different APIs we have. You can see the specific operations that you can perform. And then in the middle column here, you can see what are the fields that are required as input and what's like the target output schema. If you scroll down a little bit, um, you can see the try button. And then that allows you to try the specific endpoint you're looking at. Uh, and then you'll be able to see the actual result for your actual cluster, which is really super duper helpful. So you'll see the request as well as the body. Blueprint export. Yeah, so this is one thing that's used quite heavily, you know, post install. Um, but for me, at least, I was always like, go to Chrome, type in Blueprint, because I would forget format equals Blueprint. So uh, in Manage Ambari, cluster information, you can see here's a cluster Blueprint. You can copy paste it, or you can just hit the download button. Uh, yeah, exactly, Scott, no more trial, trial and error. Um, Isilon, boom. So if any of you have ever tried to get Isilon working with Ambari, it was just, I mean, page upon page upon page upon page of uh, documentation. And it was hard. It was hard for both of us. Um, they had a tough time because they had to kind of fake out the agent. They had to pretend like they're HDFS. We came up with a better way of going about that. So we built in a new capability within our management pack framework so you can kind of plug in external file systems, 1FS being one of those file systems. So now, you know, when you install the 1FS MPAC, you'll, oops, uh, you'll, you'll see 1FS show up here in the file system choice. And then when you click on next, you'll notice there's kind of no HDFS configuration because effectively 1FS is over there somewhere else managing your data. Uh, you don't need to configure it at all. All you have to do is say, where is the 1FS host? Everything else is just magic. All of our HDFS clients will be wired up to point to Isilon and you're good to go. No more 15 pages of PDFs and a lot of trial and error. Um, last but not least, stack support. So as uh, you know, I'm sure you've been hearing about Name Node Federation, Big deal for HDFS 3.0. Uh, what I kind of wanted to do is focus on what is Name Node Federation and how does it kind of work at a high level, mainly because if I don't explain it now, when I show you the UI and how we design the feature, it won't make a lot of sense. Um, so today, when you have a single namespace, when you set up Name Node HA, you're prompted for what's the name service ID? So basically, when you do HDFS colon whack whack, NS1, it knows that, hey, this is the name node pair I'm talking to. So every namespace has a name service ID. It has two name nodes, an active and standby, and two zookeeper failover controllers. There's kind of one ZKFC per name node. And there's journal nodes and data nodes. 
the funny thing about name of federation is when you set up an additional namespace, you specify what's my name service ID, where should I put my name nodes, they get ZKFCs, but they share the same journal nodes and they share the same data nodes. I know, isn't that crazy? So when we're looking at name node federation, as you're you know, adding an additional namespace, the real operation is just making sure that you can add another pair of name nodes that can use your existing journal node and data node infrastructure. So in the HDFS service summary, we have this actions menu that allows you to add a new HDFS namespace. The operation basically adds a new name node HA pair to the host um, you know, within your specific cluster. Uh, in order to actually have this menu show up, you have to have name node HA already configured. And the key things to understand are that data nodes and journals are shared between those namespaces. And this is very important from a performance perspective, you need to make sure that each of the journal nodes have a dedicated disk per namespace. And we'll see in the wizard kind of where we pop that up so you can kind of see that. This is something that's very important that Jitendo want to make sure that we kind of highlight it is for performance reasons, JANs should have a dedicated disk per namespace. So let's see what it looks like. So if I go to actions, add new HTFS namespace, number one, you'll see, hey, guess what? Planet maintenance window, we're gonna have to do a lot of stop, start, restart operations in order to get this to work. So this is definitely a downtime operation. Like you saw in that diagram, every namespace has a name service ID. So this is the name service ID of your existing namespace. You need to tell us what the new name service ID should be. So in this case, I'm gonna say, hey, my new namespace should be NS2. Click on the button. We'll ask you where you wanna put your new name node and ZKFCs. We'll give you a summary screen. And this is where you'll notice the DFS journal node edits directory is qualified. So you'll see this is the directory for namespace one, and this is the directory for namespace two. So make sure you use a different disk. Done my job. Um, the next thing is basically the wizard. So uh, we're gonna go through the process of adding those components. And there's no manual things you gotta do. Thank you very much. No commands you gotta run, the wizard just handles it. So what you'll notice after you've enabled um, Nano Federation is this screen looks different. So a couple things you'll notice is number one, the quick links are organized by namespace. So in this case, I have you know, my name service ID two and the name nodes uh, for it. And I also have a section for the specific uh, namespace as well that just covers the information about the name node and the ZKFCs. Notice no data nodes and journal nodes because they're shared, so they're at the bottom. The other thing you'll notice is uh, we had to kind of add these context menus to the actions. So if I want to restart, I might only want to restart NS1, uh, NNs, and ZKFCs, or just NS2, or all of them. So you kind of have that granularity now. Uh, also, on the HGFS metric screen, you'll see that we've also added uh, namespaces here. So you can see metrics for just one namespace or all. And then the other thing is on the dashboard itself. We've kind of split out all the name node related um, metrics into their own namespaces too. So these, will, these are changes that will pop up as soon as you enable, uh, excuse me, name node federation. Uh, Vipin has a great question. Yeah, is there a limit on how many additional namespaces we have? So originally when we designed the feature, we were like, hey, it's four, it kind of like four is a max. Um, so four is, I would say, the recommended maximum. Um, we didn't build any product limiters into that. Uh, we were gonna basically stop people at four, but the decision was made not to do that. You can have more, but I would say four is a pretty safe maximum. Um, whenever you enable NameNode Federation, VueFS is kind of like the next thing, like, okay, well, how do I make it easy to use NameNode Federation? So VueFS works as like a client-side mount table in which you can say, it's kind of like a virtual file system, and, and these paths point to this specific path on one namespace, where this path points to another path on this specific namespace. So VueFS is configured as properties, and these specific properties as you can see here, um, oh, uh, let's see here, there's a question. HFS Federation, will we see SmartSense break down into the federated namespace? Yes, we will. So in the um, SmartSense dashboards, you can see HFS metrics per namespace. Great question, Sunil. Um, HFS properties. So these guys basically say, hey, slash user should be pointing to NS1 slash user, slash project slash foo, should be pointing to NS2 slash project slash foo. It effectively allows you to kind of map directories from um, you know, kind of one, virtual namespace into multiple physical namespaces. So how do you actually go about configuring these things in Ambari? We have a section within HFS configuration for a custom VFS mount table in which you can add these properties and then you're good to go. Okay, so that's a quick 
list. This is like the complete list of all the things that we just talked about and the JIRAs associated with them. Um, but I want to pause just for a second, take any questions on those before we rock and roll. Okay, sweet. Moving on. And bar 27 compatibility. Okay, so here we've made some changes to our compatibility matrix. We've removed support in bar 27 for HTTP 2324 and 25. HTTP 26 is only really supported during the upgrade to HTTP 30. Um, the difference here is traditionally, um, bar 27 would also, you know, be able to manage kind of full time in an HTTP 26 cluster, but we have made the conscious choice not to do that in this case. So the goal is you'll use bar 27 to get you from HTTP 26 to 30, but not just sit on HTTP 26 for like a month. We've certified, you know, the kind of like the core operations you would require to move from 26 to 30, such as running service check, stop, start, restart, configuration changes, et cetera. But the goal really is get to bar 27, move you to 30. Moving on. Operating support matrix has changed. So we've added Amazon Linux, Debian 9, and Slash 12 SP3. Um, as Sumitra had talked about, you know, in the last implement session, a lot of the HTTP 30 capabilities are kind of predicated on container capabilities. So we've removed the operating systems that don't have those capabilities. So that's RHEL 6, SLES 11, Debian 7. The key, you know, when moving to Ambari 27 is you gotta make sure you're on Ambari 26 and HTTP 26. Getting to those versions, you've got some options. Um, if you're on Ambari 24 or 25, we always recommend moving up to Ambari 26 and using 26 to do any kind of stack upgrade operations. So, you know, kind of in line with our traditional recommendations, hey, if you're gonna upgrade the stack, make sure on the latest version of Ambari that supports that stack. Um, one, this is another paper cut. So I think, you know, there's folks on the phone that will appreciate this. Um, whenever it comes to, you know, talking to customers about, hey, what version of Ambari should I be using with this version of HTTP and this version of HDF? Or what all versions of Hortonworks products work with this specific JDK and this specific database? It was really, really, really hard. I think Dan kind of referred to it as like playing 3D chess. So what we did is we created a new web application that allowed you to kind of quickly and easily just click on these specific products and you can see kind of like the list of what are all the operating systems, databases, et cetera, that are supported. So how it works is you basically go to the website, you can click on a product or multiple products and you can see what are the different databases, operating systems and JDKs and any caveats uh, um, that are related to that selection uh, easily. So kind of no more, you know, consuming four or five different tables mentally in your mind and kind of, kind of trying to come up with it and then freaking out and asking everybody. This is something that we've tried to make really, really easy. Okay, moving on. Um, HTTP 3.0 upgrade. So this is probably why I'm here. Um, what we wanted to do is kind of focus on three things for the upgrade information. One is, what are the services and views that are being removed? Two, what's the kind of the overall upgrade flow and how has it changed from you know, previous upgrade flows? And then we'll talk about you know, where do you need to start and what are the caveats related to the upgrade? So number one, what are the services and views that are being removed? So we'll start with services. So Flume, Mahout, Falcon, Spark 1.6, Slider will be removed. You have the option during the upgrade process, it's kind of like a pre-step to just remove those using the delete service functionality within Bari, or we'll automatically do that as part of the upgrade. Um, hue and cascading, while not managed by Mbari, are things that uh, we won't uh, be supporting anymore in HTTP 3.0. Views that will be removed are the high view 1.5, the high view 2, the huge and view migration, slider, storm, tez, and pig. So those, are, those views are going away uh, in Ambari 2.7. And um, the views that will be retained are the capacity scheduler, the files view, smart sense, and workflow manager. Uh, if you have questions about why do we do this, what's going on, et cetera, um, you know, please feel free to ping Will uh, and Gunther. They're the views. Uh, PM and engineering leads, so they can kind of answer any more questions, or uh, you can kind of divert your comments to those guys. Uh, let's see your questions. Uh, only I got anything. Uh, some of the questions about the views. Um, the views will be removed. So in this case, I have a screenshot here of you know after you go through the upgrade, what does the list of view instances look like uh, post upgrade, and you only see the supported views. Those views will be uh, gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, Will, in his enablement session, we call, uh, we'll be talking about DAS. So, you know, in Will's enablement session, he'll talk to you a little bit more about 
the functionality DAS provides and how it can replace the uh, high views. Okay, let's talk about the overall upgrade flow next. So the overall upgrade flow looks similar to our previous, you know, HTTP 2.5 to 2.6 upgrades, but there are some specific changes and we want to go through those changes. So checking prerequisites, you're still gonna have to go through that process. We've tried to, you know, kind of weed through our documentation, ensure that, you know, we've, we've are as concise as possible because we know the more you write, the less people will read. And so we're focused really heavily on making sure this upgrade process is as concise as possible. Preparing the upgrade, making sure everything's backed up, databases, um, you know, metadata information, et cetera, very similar. Registering, installing the version looks and feels exactly like it used to, but we'll talk about some of these specific changes to the flow and why we had to do it. All right, let's see here. Um, so why new steps? So we've made specific schema changes to the environmental system, and those schema changes were made both for performance reasons as well as helping us uh, more adequately deal with multiple clusters reporting metrics into the same AMS. And because of those schema changes, we've had to kind of handle the AMS upgrade uh, specially. Same thing with SmartSense, because SmartSense depends on that AMS schema. So there's kind of sp specific steps and upgrades to deal with, you know, um, how to make sure that these are handled appropriately. We have a couple different data migration scenarios. So in this case, Atlas, we're moving from Titan to Janus. So data needs to be migrated from Titan to Janus, and there's a specific script and process that you'll follow in the documentation to make that move. And Ambari Infra is also moving from Solar 5 to Solar 7. So it's a big jump. Um, that data has to be backed up and re-indexed into a new schema for Solar 7, but we'll be able to gain a lot of the benefits that Solar 7 has for scalability and performance. So it's uh, definitely a positive move, but it adds some bumps to the upgrade process. One thing I also wanted to stress is that the upgrade itself will be express only. This is something that we've you know, kind of communicated in the past, but I just want to make sure uh, we uh, are reiterating that, hey, there's no rolling upgrade from HTTP 2.6 to 3.0, express only. Um, so the, this is some of the reasoning and rationale behind these you know, additional steps. After you have finalized your upgrade, you can then migrate your Ambari and Infrastore data back into your new indices. And we have all that uh, documented. So what I wanted to do is kind of point out what are some specific upgrade starting points and caveats. So number one is operating systems. So as we had mentioned before, HTTP 3 and Ambari 2.7 have removed some of the kind of non-container capable operating systems from the mix. This means that you need to be on like, you know, at RHEL 7, SLES 12, Amazon Linux or Debian 9 uh, across the entire cluster. So previously we had supported like CentOS 6 and CentOS 7 in the same cluster. But in this case, since CentOS 6, for example, is uh, not supported with HTTP 3.0, the whole cluster needs to be on CentOS, you know, one of these operating systems uh, entirely. In the documentation, we will have specific um, high level guidance on how to go about doing that. We have kind of two primary processes that can be followed for customers that are looking at, you know, moving from CentOS 6 to CentOS 7. And we'll have just, like I said, high level guidance. If a customer is looking for like extreme handholding or um, specific, you know, steps for their environment, we would, you know, uh, encourage them to reach out to professional services, but we'll be providing some guidance. Um, the question in the chat, customers on CentOS 6 can't use HTTP 3, that's correct. Um, you need to be on CentOS 7, for example, to be able to get to HTTP 3. Databases. So on the database side, we have upgraded, or I should say, um, you know, updated our certification matrix. So um, you need to be on Postgres 10 or MariaDB 10.2, MySQL 5.7, or Oracle 12C or 11GR2. These are things um, that a customer would need to do if they're on older versions of Postgres for things like Hive, Uzi, et cetera. We need to upgrade the databases. And you need to be on Bari 2.6. We always recommend the latest version of Bari, Bari 2.6.2.2. Um, and from an HTTP perspective, we'll support upgrading customers from HTTP 2.6 to 3.0, uh, any version of 2.6, but 2.6.5 is recommended. Uh, the reason that I state this is because there are some specific processes, manual processes that users would have to follow for the Hive upgrade if they're not on 2.6.5, but those will be documented. Um, any kind of questions even now or going forward about, you know, our specific operating system or platform support matrix, feel free to reach out to Niru. She's the go-to person for what are we certifying, when are we certifying it, any kind of questions you might have as far as like HA databases or when do we certify a CentOS 7.5, uh, she's the best resource to give you the, uh, the concise answer about that. 
All right, upgrade documentation. So one of the things I wanted to make sure we call out is please follow the documentation, read it, and follow the steps linearly. We're putting a lot of work into making sure the upgrade guide is something that you can just follow step by step. Um, and it has been changed. We've removed a lot of extraneous content to make it more concise. So I encourage you to heed the warnings, do what it says, and follow it step by step. All right, with that said, that's all I had for today. I wanted to take any kind of questions that people have, you know, maybe first in the MR27 features, and then we can talk about the upgrade. So I would say feel free to ask away. I see a lot of questions about DAS and DPS. I would say definitely, you know, ping Will, and he'll cover a lot of those details in his upcoming enablement session. Okay, great. Um, Ambari native HA support. So yeah, I was debating, there's a whole lot of Ambari 3.0 roadmap that we have planned. Um, I did not include that in this field awareness because I just want to just show you what is real. Um, but um, Ambari HA support is something that we have planned for Ambari 3.0. So it will be active passive, it'll use pacemaker and core sync. Um, it'll be, be similar to how Cloudera Manager handles HA, um, but that's something that we do have firm plans for Ambari 3.0 is making sure we have Ambari for HA. Hey, Paul, Mark, a uh, quick yeah. question on the name node federation. At what point would you want to add more journal nodes to scale out? That is a great question. You know, I think um, that is one of those questions I think would be really, really well handled by Jatendra. I don't know at, you know, kind of what point or heuristic you should use to say, hey, mm -hmm. I, I need to, you know, move from three to five journal nodes or whatever it might be. So unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you, Mark. Okay, that's fine. Well, a follow up. A follow up. Uh, would would there ever be a good idea to have separate journal nodes for each of your namespaces? Um, so that's something that I don't believe is possible. I think um, the journal nodes and data nodes are kind of shared infrastructure. Okay. Across namespaces. Okay. Yeah. But right. I think the thing to like, like really, really, I want to make sure I hit that hard is um, make sure underneath. Yeah. Okay, thanks. No worries. Uh, so Paul, uh, have a question. So yeah. there are some of the customers who has around 1500 nodes cluster size, right? Like with this somebody, do you see them, the performance will be much faster? Yes, especially on the Embarry server UI. I think, you know, any, anytime you're getting above, uh, honestly, like even like 500 nodes, you should see a performance improvement, especially around just the general responsiveness of the UI. Um, like I mentioned, there are still some areas of the UI that, that we're going to try to tackle in Ambari 271 to really, really hammer the performance on, um, specifically the configuration screen, as well as um, the host list are still things where it can take some time to kind of come back, even with the UI changes we made. But everything else should be much more responsive for customers in large clusters. Does that make sense, Amar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Vinod had a question about architectural changes in AMS. Um, we have the schema change that we made in AMS, and there's also a lot of changes that are kind of smaller, more um, nuanced changes that we've made to the configuration process. So one of the things that we noticed when we were doing kind of support case analysis with Amar uh, was, you know, people had trouble configuring AMS for optimal performance. So Sid and Arvind and, and the team worked hard in Bar 27 to make that configuration stack advisor recommendations better and easier. Um, I didn't call it out specifically in the enablement just because it's kind of an under the covers thing, but the node uh, schema is the main architectural change, um, but it should be easier to figure out of the box for better performance as well. Thanks, Paul. And, and do we have any HA for Ambari Matrix Collector? We do, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we actually had that for, we've had that for a while. So even in Ambari 2.6, you can just go and you can add additional metrics collectors. Those, yeah, I mean, like, did we integrate to in, into Ambari, like, uh, from the UI, how to enable that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you just go to a host that you want to put a metrics collector on it, hit add component, and then select metrics collector. And then magically, you'll have another metrics collector that can scale out reads, writes, and aggregation operations. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so it's, it's really actually simple. The only kind of prereq is you got to make sure you're using distributed storage so that the AMS data is on HDFS. Once you've done that, you can just add additional metrics collectors, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, and those will be used and configured for metric read, write, and um, aggregation. Oh, there we go. Getting too fancy with the video. PowerPoint dynamic. Um, let's see here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. 
can Ambari run as Docker container as well? Sure, um, if you want to. It's not something that we've tested though. <laughs> Sorry, Giro. Anything else, folks? Uh, Biology, unfortunately, no, there's no Hue migration support. That's one of those views that uh, did not make the cut, unfortunately. But feel free to reach out to Will and Gunther and those guys um, if you have any concerns about that and they can help you navigate that better than I can. Sweet. All right, thanks, everyone. I will make this recording available. Um, really appreciate all the interaction. You guys are the best. Have a great one. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Yep, see ya.